chapter uh, 8, going to look at the first 25 verses, principles of uh, persecution, and it's just the stage we're at here uh, in the church and the development of the church, uh, studying through the, uh, the book of Acts. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and, and controversy. We certainly saw the measure of a man last week in, uh, uh, in Stephen. Uh, not only in his uh, brilliant uh, defense uh, of the faith before the Sanhedrin, uh, but of course in the way that he died, forgiving his, uh, his enemies and uh, with the full anticipation of seeing the Lord, which he, uh, which he did. And, uh, uh, and of course the message there about uh, forgiveness and the power of it. Uh, here in uh, Acts chapter 8, we hit a turning point uh, in the book as the uh, uh, focus will begin begin to shift, we're not done, but begin to shift away from Jerusalem. Uh, and in fact, uh, most of what occurs in chapter 8 uh, in our passage this morning is going to be up in the area of, uh, of Samaria, which if you looked on a, a map of Israel today would be the area of the, we refer to as the, as the West Bank. But uh, a turning point is uh, uh, we'll, we'll see the spotlight shift of what we would call the first missionary, which is, uh, is Philip. Well, uh, again, Persecution uh, begins. Uh, it's uh, certainly fueled by a man named Saul of Tarsus that we've been uh, introduced to. And uh, we're going to look at what it does in terms of the motivation for the, the church uh, and getting the gospel out. So we're saying that in the first three verses, it provided motivation for obedience to the Great Commission. Verse 1, now Saul was consenting to his death. And of course, that would have been the death of Stephen we saw last time. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to a prison. So, as I mentioned, Saul certainly is that the... Uh, uh, the center and the heart of this persecution uh, driving it. Uh, in verse 3, when it says he made havoc, NIV says he uh, began to destroy the church. And uh, that word describes a, a wild animal tearing its prey apart. So what's taking place here uh, is, uh, is very violent. Uh, Paul is seeking to do all that he can to get people to renounce their faith in Jesus uh, as the Messiah. And of course, if they're willing to do that, uh, then uh, they're able to go free. Uh, so there certainly is uh, imprisonment, there's torture, uh, and we've read in other passages, Paul even, not just consenting in the case of uh, the death of Stephen, uh, apparently uh, he will see to the martyrdom of, uh, of others. You can understand why the Apostle Paul could never get over the grace of God later when he comes to uh, faith in, uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, he describes himself this way in Philippians 3.5, in regard to this idea of persecution of his background, he says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisees, concerning seal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, uh, blameless. So he kept the law, uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews, but in terms of his zeal for God, he showed that by his persecution of the church. Again, approving the death of Stolmans, of Stephen, persecuting here men and women in prison, beating them. Uh, and again, the word to describe that is a word of a very violent word. Notice uh, the contrast, though, in verse 2. And devout men carried Stephen to his bur burial. Now, it's interesting. It doesn't say uh, other brothers in Christ, uh, other brothers in the Lord, other family members. So the idea of devout men were just other religious Jews. Uh, Hellenistic Jews, probably, that knew Stephen, uh, that it, uh, admired him, had a relationship with him, cared for him. Uh, and so they go uh, and they uh, are lamenting him and, uh, and they bury him. Which shows you uh, many, the, the contradiction and the turmoil within Judaism within the first century. Uh, you had men like this that 
watched what was going on in terms of the proclamation that Jesus was the Messiah, uh, may have considered that, may have thought about that, but they weren't violent about it. They just saw that as another sect of Judaism, like the Pharisees, like the Sadducees, like the Zealots, and so forth. Uh, but you had others like Saul of Tarsus, who were basically, uh, they were bent on doing everything they could to actually absolutely physically destroy uh, believers in, in Jesus Christ. So uh, it continues to be quite the, quite the contrast. Uh, by the time you have the destruction of the temple in 70 AD uh, and the city surrounded initially in 68 AD uh, by the Romans' armies, Josephus says, you know, there's, there's well over 100,000 believers in Jesus in the, in, uh, in the city. So the church continues to grow, and it continues to be a controversy within Judaism uh, for a very long period of time. Secondly, uh, Jesus is uh, preparing the church. Uh, he's going to allow this uh, persecution to come. He's preparing the one to go, to go into the world, to fulfill the great commission that uh, he had given in Matthew 28. And uh, we said that... Uh, uh, in our overview of the book, that Acts 1.8 actually gives us the outline of the book and how it uh, really comes to play. Jesus said, but the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both here in Jerusalem, and we've already seen that, uh, Judea and Samaria. Now the persecution is driving them further in the south to Judea and now into the north, into Samaria, uh, and eventually to the ends of the earth. So we're in that second, second phase here. Uh, notice that the apostles remained, though, at the end of verse 1. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Sometimes they're, uh, they're, they're criticized because, uh, uh, you know, they didn't get out there and get going and f fulfilling the Great Commission. But keep in mind, they remained under persecution. They remained under the threat of death. They showed great courage. They weren't wimping out on what God was telling them to do. Uh, there were thousands of people that are coming to faith in Christ in Jerusalem that they are trying and attempting to disciple. And, of course, there are tens of thousands that have not heard the gospel yet. And apparently they're going to hang in there and stay in there as long as they can uh, before, of course, we know from church history they are, they are all driven out uh, and uh, literally take the gospel uh, around the world. The, uh, so they remain. Uh, Jesus is preparing them, of course, to embrace this idea of suffering uh, as the church is persecuted and, in fact, enter into the suffering uh, of the Lord. Jesus suffered. Uh, they are learning to suffer right along with him. Uh, and, of course, God is using it to fulfill his purposes of getting the gospel out to Samaria uh, and Judea. Later, Paul would be persecuted himself as a believer and say this about persecution in Philippians 3.10. He said that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, and if by any means I may attain to the resurrection uh, of the dead. Paul was a guy that had known about the Messiah, but now he had come to know him personally, the knowledge of Christ. Uh, he had known what it was to attempt to have a righteousness of his own by attempting to follow the 613 commandments of the Torah, uh, but now he had a righteousness of Christ imputed to him. Uh, he had, uh, uh, now knows the fellowship of Christ. Before he knew a set of rules, and now he has a friend. He has a master. He has a companion, someone leading and guiding and directing his life. And, of course, all that led to uh, and is combined with this idea of fe the fellowship of his uh, suffering. It meant that he would uh, live like Christ. It meant that he had a common enemy, as we do today. We've already mentioned the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, in the last century uh, there were more people martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ than all other centuries combined. And we're well on our way uh, into uh, the century, the 21st century that uh, we're in uh, now as per persecution uh, continues. As we uh, read about the civil war in, uh, in Syria, one of the things we don't read a lot about is the Christians that are in Syria uh, that are being persecuted by both sides in every rebel group that, uh, that comes through. And some of the first cities that were destroyed, uh, like in Aleppo and others, those were Christian communities. We just hear about people in Syria being destroyed, and of course it's affecting everybody, but a lot of it uh, continues to be directed against, uh, against Christians. The ones that are surviving are able to survive because they're, they're actually paying the rebels for protection. 
uh, basically to to not to, to not kill him. And it goes on and on. We have the the Coptic uh, Christian. I saw a picture of a young man who was uh, set on fire uh, recently by pulled out of his home and so forth. Uh, and it uh, and it continues uh, around the world. We're very fortunate to uh, live in the the West, uh, but many of them. Uh, believe that as they go through these things that are, are entering into suffering of the Lord, uh, they are going through what he is going through. And obviously, as we read in the book of Revelation, there's a very special place in heaven uh, and a crown for those that have suffered martyrdom for the faith uh, of Christ. Uh, Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 4.17 about this idea of what he's been through in terms of persecution. For our light affliction, that's how Paul puts it, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are uh, eternal. We were, uh, <clears throat> Kathy and I were just talking about and kind of praying for uh, friends in China because uh, I don't know if you saw on the news, but yesterday there was a terrorist attack in a, uh, in a city that we go to in the southwest of China, and there were about 30 people killed and about 130 people wounded uh, and so forth by extremists uh, that, are, that are there. And, uh, and of course, uh, having been there and knowing people there, we kind of begin to pray for the people that we know and hope that everybody is okay. It's a train station we've been through. Uh, stayed The last time we were there, we stayed two blocks from that train station. Uh, this would be like hearing about 130 people being killed at Alamoana Shopping Center yesterday. It's a, a place that everybody goes through. But uh, it certainly uh, gives you a heart for, uh, for the people there and what they're going through. Uh, we were in a, um, <clears throat> a little tea shop that uh, we were there, and the, uh, the owner we knew was a Christian. Obviously, one of the reasons that we went to buy tea from her. And uh, we had an opportunity with a translator with us to do a little Bible study. Uh, we shared a little bit afterwards, and then she mentioned to us this idea of a back to Jerusalem movement. Now, we know about that from reading about China uh, and, and the Chinese and what they've gone through and are going through. Uh, but we were surprised that she, she knew about it and she mentioned it and so forth. Uh, and what it is is a, a belief by Chinese believers that uh, they may be the very ones to take the gospel now back to Jerusalem. The gospel started at Jerusalem and went around the world. Uh, they can take it uh, back to Jerusalem. Of course, you have to pass through a few Muslim countries uh, on the way there. And uh, they believe that they have been prepared and are well suited to do that. One, because they're non-Western, they might be accepted a little more. And two, because they're used to persecution. They would assume that they will be persecuted and maybe die along the way. But if there's enough of them and they continue, they can get the gospel all the way back to Jerusalem. Uh, they're not running from it. They're really running into it uh, if it means getting the gospel to someone else. It's just a very different view uh, about safety and about, the uh, uh, again, the price of we're willing to pay to get the gospel to someone else. But the persecution provided the motivation here for the obedience to the Great Commission. And secondly, uh, it brought power to their preaching. Look at verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Uh, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Uh, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So uh, we would say this power made everyone preachers. Uh, that's, that's what it says. Uh, in verse uh, 4, there's a, a therefore. Uh, the therefore is referring back to the persecution. Because of the persecution. Because of what's uh, going on. What Saul is doing. Uh, heading this whole thing up. Uh, it made everyone preachers. Uh, two things happened. They were scattered. Uh, and they were preaching. Verse 5, then Philip went down. The then ties it to the previous uh, uh, verse. This is happening. It's a therefore. The then Peter does, uh, uh, Philip does the same thing. He also is driven and driven out of the city because of persecution, but uh, driven to uh, Samaria. Uh, the church is scattered. It's the motivation for why many are going. Uh, all of them are preaching. Uh, the term in verse 5 when it says, 
he preached Christ to them is the term we would often translate evangelism. So he's definitely out there telling them the gospel. Uh, in verse 12 it says, but when they believed Philip as he preached, it's a different Greek word, uh, and it uh, speaks of someone that's a herald, someone that comes to bring good news. So he's giving them the good news of Jesus Christ, but he's preaching and doing evangelism uh, with them wherever he goes. Uh, and of course, uh, secondly, we say this power was demonstrated uh, in their lives. Look at verse 6. And the multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. So he's out proclaiming the gospel. He's out like a herald telling other people the good news uh, about Jesus Christ. Uh, it's all been driven uh, and motivated because of the persecution that uh, uh, is going on. Uh, and... Uh, the NIV says, all paid close attention to what he said. Uh, and it's all being authenticated by these miracles, by casting out demons uh, by, and by doing miracles and signs uh, and wonders. Now, in the same way, when Jesus came, he authenticated his Messiahship uh, by doing miracles. Uh, and in many cases, miracles only the Messiah could do. Uh, the apostles we've already seen, they're out delivering this message uh, that would be controversial, of course. Uh, within Judaism, but they're authenticating the message by doing incredible signs and wonders and miracles. And remember, the people were even bringing their sick family members and relatives, hoping that even the shadow of Peter might be cast upon them, uh, that they might be healed. Now we've got Philip up there, uh, and the same occurrence is going on. God uses and does miracles to grab people's attention that they might listen closely uh, to the words of the gospel. A miracle doesn't save anyone. And people don't come to faith in Christ simply because of a miracle, but often it will get their attention and cause them to uh, uh, listen to what the person has to say. Uh, and that's what we see taking place here uh, in Samaria. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, uh, it talks about this idea of uh, these signs and their purpose. Verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord? And was confirmed to uh, us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So, uh, again, God continues to certainly do this in a lot of areas on the mission field where the gospel is just getting, getting out to new areas. Uh, God seems to enable men and women to do Tremendous signs and wonders and miracles to arrest people's attention uh, and, uh, and, of course, uh, uh, have them come to faith in Christ. We see God do miracles uh, among us and heal people and so forth because he loves us, because he cares for us, uh, because he has compassion uh, on us and so forth. I don't think that he needs to do that to attest to or confirm the, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's pretty permeated in our culture and so forth. Uh, but he continues to still do uh, miraculous things. Uh, but again, I, and I can tell you personally, have been to places like India and Pakistan and other places and preached and prayed for people and seen God heal and do miraculous things. It's amazing, but they all don't come to Christ, uh, which is kind of astounding. But I've seen the same thing right here in Hawaii. Pray for people, seem God uh, heal people of cancer, all kinds of different things. They still don't come to faith in Christ. It's amazing. But uh, sometimes they do, and sometimes their family does, or someone else sees and they know. And, but it, it's meant to arrest the attention and give a confirmation of the message that's being spoken, uh, and that's what we see here. The result was, in verse 8, and there was great joy uh, in that city. So Luke continues to emphasize the joy uh, of what it is to walk with the Lord, the joy that there is in a be being in obedience to the leading and guiding and directing the Holy Spirit. Uh, does that mean it was an easy time? No, it wasn't an easy time. They've had to flee. They left their families. They left their home. They left every possession they had. They left their jobs. They, they fled. But yet there could be a joy uh, in their lives because of their relationship with God. And here the whole city is filled. Later in chapter 13 of verse uh, 52, Luke would write, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. It'll be an ongoing theme of Luke as he writes to point out the, the joy despite circumstances uh, in the life of the early church. So persecution is uh, driving, providing uh, obedience to the Great Commission. 
Uh, it brought uh, power uh, again to preaching, not just Phillips. Everyone, wherever they went, were preaching the gospel. Third, persecution produced what we've already mentioned, the first missionary. That's in verse 9. <clears throat> but there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city <coughs> and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least, least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. So Philip, we would say, uh, as a missionary, uh, would have never gone to Samaria uh, had it not been for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, keep in mind, uh, there's uh, tremendous animosity. That's a fancy word for hatred <laughs> between, the, between the Jews and, and between the Samaritans. They didn't like each other. It wasn't like, well, we like them, they just don't like us. No, they didn't really care for, uh, care for each other. And uh, as we uh, study the Gospels and the life of Jesus, and as uh, those in Galilee in the north would travel down to Jerusalem, they would go around <coughs> Samaria. They would never go through it. And, of course, that's why when Jesus did, his uh, uh, disciples uh, had thought he'd kind of flipped out and couldn't figure out why in the world he would actually go through this area of, uh, of Samaria. Again, keep in mind who they who they were. They uh, basically, at one point in time, Israel, in terms of the, the nation of Israel, splits into uh, because of taxes. That, that, that'll kind of do it sometimes. And, uh, and they split into because of taxes. Uh, there's a, a kingdom uh, of the north called Israel, and the kingdom of the south referred to as Judah. Uh, the kingdom of the north falls into idolatry. And, uh, I mean, it's a, they, they build... Um, uh, we've been to the ruins in, in Dan of one of the temples that they built. The, uh, the other one is in Bethel. The idea is we better build our own temples. We better have our own priesthood. We better have our own system of worship. Otherwise, people will still want to go back down to Jerusalem for the feast three times a year and so forth. So we better come up with a substitute. They do. They, they worship a calf god and so forth. Uh, it gets worse than that, of course. And they end up eventually uh, uh, sacrificing their children. Uh, and, uh, and horrible things take place. Uh, God finally, after warning uh, for centuries through the prophets, uh, brings judgment against them. And that judgment was to bring the Assyrians, who were uh, very cruel people, uh, in to basically capture and remove them out of the land. And that's what the Assyrians did. Uh, the Romans, when they captured somebody, they just basically put a Roman garrison and they ruled over the people uh, that were in that particular province or, or area. The Assyrians didn't do that. They actually pulled the people out and they dispersed them into other areas of, of their <laughs> empire and then they imported others and, and they brought them in. There might be a few uh, Jewish people left behind, uh, but there are so few that within a few generations they are, are completely integrated to this uh, uh, other mixtures of cultures that have uh, come in. Uh, so the Samaritans uh, were basically Gentile. Uh, and very, uh, very pagan. Uh, there's a passage in 2 Kings 17 that uh, talks about this process. There, there in verse 24 it says, Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, uh, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and uh, Sephavaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. And it was so at the beginning of their dwelling there that they, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, uh, which killed uh, some of them. Uh, so basically, you've got these other people groups that have come in, uh, and, uh, and they are actually being, uh, being killed by, uh, by mountain lions uh, and so forth. Uh, and so there's the, the suggestion uh, that... Uh, uh, we need to know who the, uh, the gods of this area were. They always thought that uh, in the ancient world that gods were, were localized, the little demigods that were over geographic periods uh, or, or places. So if we know, we know what the rituals are, we can do the rituals, and then we won't be attacked this way. Uh, very superstitious. Verse 26, so they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations whom you have removed in places in the cities of Samaria... Do not know the rituals of the God of the land. 
Therefore, he sent lions among them, and indeed, they are killing them because they, don't, they do not know the rituals of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, uh, Send there one of the priests uh, whom you brought from there. Let him go and dwell there, and let him teach them the rituals of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, taught them how they should fear the Lord. So they take one of the Jewish priests who were part of this Baal worship, calf worship, uh, kill your kids worship. Not a good priest, bad priest. They take one of those guys, they send him back over there and said, teach these people how to worship. You can see why their worship was just a little off. <laughs> so they, they basically uh, still remember and understand some Jewish uh, traditions. They have some of the uh, of the of the Torah, some of the the Book of Moses, and so forth, uh, but they thought the Jews have got it all wrong. They're going to worship a Mount Gerizim. They just developed their own their own thing. So basically, they're they're a quasi Gentile Jewish cult that that's uh, going on. These are the Samaritans. You're going to say why Jewish people are like don't think we'll have anything to do with them, uh, and um, uh, and, and vice versa. So that's all to say that our point is is that. Philip would have never gone there if the Holy Spirit wasn't leading. Yes, the, 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 the persecution was driving believers out. Uh, and the persecution, uh, we, would, we would say in our mind, was, man, that's not a good thing. But yet God was using. God was using all things together for good. Uh, and everywhere they went, they were preaching. But here Philip, as the first missionary, uh, is led by the Holy Spirit to go to a very unlikely place. Uh, Samaria spoke the same language, but a very different culture, uh, and it had to be, of course, it would be shocking to the apostles back in Jerusalem that he'd done this. Uh, they're going to have to send uh, Peter and John up there to figure out what is going on uh, in this city, uh, and uh, I'm sure they went with a lot of cynicism and a lot of criticism before they arrive on the scene uh, and see what God is doing among the uh, Samaritans. But the foundation... Uh, for this missionary work. Secondly, we say it had already been laid by another person, uh, and that's by Jesus Christ. Now, you remember in John's Gospel, you have Jesus uh, wanting to, uh, against the objections of the disciples, to go right through Samaria. Uh, they arrive at a well. Uh, the, a woman comes out at a time of day when women did not normally go to a well. The reason she's there at that time of day is because she would never be accepted by the other women because as Jesus engages her in conversation, uh, he reveals the fact that she's had four husbands and the guy she's living with now is not her husband uh, and so forth. Uh, and so she basically is uh, disenfranchised uh, even as a Samaritan living in that city. But of course, Jesus uh, has this conversation with her about uh, uh, water and living water and what he can do and he reveals the fact that he is the Messiah. She believes him that he is the Messiah because of what he has said to her. And you remember, she goes back into the city. She tells everyone that the Messiah is here. Uh, she brings out a whole crowd of people uh, with her. Uh, and, uh, and they hear Jesus and, uh, and see him and so forth. That's the groundwork uh, for this, this episode, uh, this first missionary journey. And the fact that there is a great revival and uh, there are certainly hundreds, if not thousands, of people uh, that are coming to faith in Christ in this uh, very unlikely place, uh, the city of, uh, of Samaria. Which all should speak to us, uh, of course, uh, of Philip and this woman, is the impact that one person can have. Uh, here, this woman, uh, we don't know her name, which is referred to her as the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, she believes uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. And she is able to go and convince others to come and hear what he has to say. Uh, that lays the foundation for everything that Philip is now doing in that city. And of course, Philip would understand this uh, same principle and this idea. If you look a little further down to verse 26, we'll cover this next time. But there it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he uh, prayed about it many days, consulted several individuals. No, he just arose and he went. Uh, Philip was one of those guys, you tell him to jump, and he said, how high? You know, he just, God tells him to go. Uh, again, keep in mind, 
he's overseeing. Uh, he basically is the Billy Graham. He's the Greg Laurie of Samaria. <laughs> and God says, I want you to leave this huge work that I'm doing in the city. And I, I want you to go to a very deserted place down there in the Gaza Strip, in the middle of the desert. Uh, very hot, very uncomfortable. And I want you to just kind of stand there on the side of the road until some guy comes by. And of course, we know the story. He goes down, the Ethiopian eunuch comes by. He's got a scroll, the Isaiah scroll, uh, and, uh, and he can't understand it. Philip jumps up in his uh, BMW with him uh, and begins, to, it was a chariot, but I, I think it was a BMW chariot, uh, and begins, because he's a very wealthy guy, and begins to explain to him then uh, what, uh, what the scroll was all about. The Ethiopian uh, gets saved, uh, he is baptized, uh, jumps back in his BMW, drives back down to North Africa, and reaches an entire continent with the gospel of, of, of Jesus Christ. And of course, I mentioned the Copts, Coptic Christians that are being persecuted in Egypt today trace their spiritual ancestry back to this one man, uh, the, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, one person, a woman at a well in an encounter with Jesus, ends up sharing the gospel, laying the groundwork, little did she know, for a revival of the entire city. Uh, one person, Philip, willing to leave that because he understands the principle and he's willing to obey Jesus and go down and share the gospel with one person so that a whole continent might be reached with the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, our job really is not, in some ways, is not to reach the world with the gospel. It's just to reach one person. You know, we'll all just be obedient to that one person that God calls us to, uh, uh, where we can share our faith. Uh, we're able to uh, lead them to faith in Jesus Christ and do what we can to disciple them. Uh, little do we know how God might uh, use it. Jesus uh, gave an uh, illustration of evangelism, and he said some people, when they come to faith in Christ, it's like a 30-fold harvest. Others, it's like a 60-fold harvest. Sometimes it's like a 100-fold harvest. We never know who that one person might be. Thirdly, we'd say of his missionary work, uh, it's to, he was a, a bridge builder into another, into another culture. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, uh, that's what God calls us to be. Uh, he was at least able to go in. Uh, he knew the language. He was able to build a bridge. I'm sure he didn't go in condemning them. He went in then sharing the, the good news. Remember those words? He was like a herald giving the good news uh, out to other people. He was a proclaiming he was actually preaching the gospel. He was giving, giving them the goods uh, in terms of the message, uh, but he was also doing it in such a way that it was good news to their ears. Uh, and certainly God wants us to, with encounters with other people, to try to figure out how to build a bridge. Uh, maybe they're not open to the gospel right away. So I just build a bridge of friendship initially. Maybe I find some commonality. I find some way. There's some common theme. If they're into football. I begin to tell them about all the football players that uh, are actually Christians. So they're, they're into, what are they into? What, what is the bridge I can build with them so that I can share the gospel? Jesus said with the uh, woman at the well, Hey, you've got water. I've got water you don't know anything about. He told Nicodemus, you must be born again. How can I be born again? He'd already been born again every way he possibly could. Again, building bridges, uh, building interests, getting from small talk to big talk so that we might be able to share the gospel uh, with, with others. There's a little book uh, with a woman's testimony simply entitled uh, uh, Pearl that came out a number of years ago. Uh, and she was a woman that uh, shared her faith wherever she could go. Uh, but uh, at the end of her life, she had cancer, which, uh, according to her, was the most exciting time in her life because, uh, because with cancer, she got to go to the hospital on many occasions. And, of course, she's in a cancer ward uh, where people are dying, which was very <laughs> exciting to her because people were more open to the gospel there uh, than anywhere else she'd ever been. And every time she went to the hospital, every time she led someone, to, at least one person, to faith in Christ, before she left again. So every time the doctor said, you'll need to go back to the hospital for more treatment. Praise the Lord. And she began to call her prayer partners. I'm going back again to lead someone else to faith in Christ. It's just a very different perspective. Uh, in that case, her cancer she saw as a bridge that would allow her to reach out to other people that have uh, cancer. Uh, circumstances can look so bleak sometimes. 
but yet God is orchestrating persecution and allowing it here that the Great Commission might be fulfilled. Uh, and a man like Philip understood this concept of reaching one person with the gospel. Now we come to a very interesting person. We've already mentioned him in verse 9, uh, point 4, the sorcerer's profession of faith. Very interesting character. Uh, but there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city uh, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all had uh, gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, uh, this man is uh, the great power uh, of God. So uh, his influence in the city obviously is very extensive. Uh, and uh, here we've got the gospel going forth, and we've got Satan's counterfeit uh, being uh, met with it there. Uh, he's practicing sorcery. Uh, he's doing uh, miracles uh, and so forth, obviously energized by, by Satan. Uh, there was a, you know, I haven't grown up in the church, but not really uh, knowing the Lord. I, I can just tell you that um, when I first uh, realized or saw or heard about uh, someone uh, with an ability to do something miraculous, I just figured they were a good guy. I just figured they, you know, God is in the business of miracles. If somebody's doing miracles, they must be from God. Uh, obviously, that's not true. Uh, here, Simon the Sorcerer is able to do these things. Uh, there's a lot of people out there today that are able to do miraculous things. It doesn't mean that they're, uh, that they're from, uh, from God. Uh, and we need to be very, very careful. Uh, again, uh, Philip is there preaching. There's joy in the city. Great things are, are happening. But there's, uh, in a sense, a, a confrontation here spiritually. Uh, 1 John 4.4, 4, very important verse for us, says, uh, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because uh, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Uh, Philip did his miracles by the power of God to glorify God. Um, if we step out to try to build a bridge, if we step out to believe that if we can reach one person with the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, we can make a huge difference. Uh, there will be pushback uh, in the spiritual realm from Satan. Uh, it's important to know that greater is he, the Holy Spirit that's in us, is greater than he, Satan, that's in the, in the world. Uh, and here, uh, notice a couple of things. Uh, very interesting. Verse 9, it says, but then, and it's a reference to the occultism uh, of Simon. Verse 12, but when, when people believed in the preaching of Philip, uh, and then verse 13, uh, then Simon, then Simon comes on the scene. There's sorcery, there's the occult, uh, it's in the city, uh, but the power of God is overriding that. People are coming to faith in him, uh, but there's a pushback. If I can't beat them, I'll join them, in a sense, uh, comes Simon the sorcerer. And uh, a couple of things that are interesting about him, uh, one is the fact that uh, he will attempt uh, to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to see that uh, uh, as we get to uh, verse 9. Uh, so therefore, there's a, a whole term, Simon, Simon or uh, is a, a reference to the fact that people attempt to purchase things uh, on behalf of God. Uh, and in the church, in the uh, Western Church of, of Europe, it was very prevalent for, uh, for hundreds of years that you could, you could purchase a position. You wanted to be uh, a bishop, it will cost you this much. You want to be an archbishop, it will cost you this much. You want to be a, you want to be a, a cardinal, it will cost you two archbishops. And you know, basically, <laughs> it's kind of like Monopoly. And, uh, and, uh, and these positions, literally in church history, were purchased. Uh, and a lot of people trace it back to, or at least identify it with the name of this man here. So he's an interesting person for the fact that he tried to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit. And secondly, because of verse 13, he appears to be a believer. It says he believed and he was baptized. So was Simon the sorcerer really a believer? Come back next week. We're going to, no, we're going to go on and uh, look at that very, uh, very question here. Uh, persecution gave Peter and John a new perspective of the gospel. We're going to kind of get the big guns from Jerusalem to come up and see what's going on. They are going to have an encounter with this man, Simon. Verse 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, 
They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the uh, apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Uh, you have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So sort of thing about the, the perspective of Peter and John. It's being their point of view. It's being changed uh, by coming up here to uh, Samaria. Uh, and first we notice that it's changed because it, it caused them or allowed them, we would say, this opportunity to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, notice again verse uh, 16. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So there's a revival in the city. Peter's there preaching. Uh, many are coming to faith in God. He's doing uh, miracles and so forth. There's great joy uh, in, the, in the city. Uh, but none of them yet have been baptized uh, in the Holy Spirit. Uh, Peter and John come up there, again, probably cynically, uh, maybe critically, wondering what in the world uh, Philip is doing with the Samaritans. But, of course, they get there. They see the work of God, uh, and they see they haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they lay their hands on them. They pray for them to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, kind of when we did our overview, and certainly when we got to Acts chapter 2, we talked about the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, this, is, this is the typical where <laughs> someone comes to faith in Christ, and then as a subsequent and a separate work, Beyond conversion, uh, they are baptized uh, in, in the Holy Spirit. Again, Jesus said the purpose of that uh, is that the Holy Spirit would come upon you with power uh, so that you can be my uh, witnesses. Uh, we're gonna, uh, we've seen that with the disciples. Uh, we saw it early in the book of Acts. We're going to see it uh, again later. Of course, the pattern gets broken uh, at the house of Cornelius where it all happens uh, simultaneously. But we see the pattern here. Again, we'll see it at the conversion of the Apostle Paul. He comes to faith in Christ on the Damascus Road, and a subsequent time later, uh, he's baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, Simon is there, and obviously something occurs. He sees something, hears something, something happens, uh, and he says, give me this power also. In other words, uh, the Apostle lays their hands on him, they pray for them, and obviously something happened. The people didn't just go, well, thank you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> that doesn't make Simon go, I want that power. I think they probably all spoke in tongues. Uh, I think that was probably the evidence that Simon sees. It certainly is, uh, uh, doesn't happen in all situations and all occasions uh, because uh, of what we know from Paul's teaching later to the church in Corinth. Uh, but uh, uh, I would suspect that something, something, something visible, something happened that Simon says, I want that power uh, and I'm willing to, uh, to pay for it. But our whole point here is that once again, we see that this power to be a witness for Jesus Christ, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, happens subsequent to uh, their actual conversion. Uh, secondly, uh, there's a new perspective that have allowed Peter and John insight. Uh, in dealing with, uh, with Simon. Uh, Philip, we don't know if he was aware of, uh, of Simon, uh, whether he was really saved or, or not. Uh, but again, uh, I want to give you at least three reasons why we believe that he's not. One is what Peter says to him. Look at verse 20. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you. Uh, that would lead me to believe he's going to perish. <laughs> he didn't say if you perish, your money perish uh, perish with you. Uh, that's not often said to believers. <laughs> Verse 21, you have neither part or portion of this matter, for your heart's not right in the sight of God. Uh, is it possible to someone to say they believe something, to even be baptized and their heart not be right with God? Uh, yeah, it's certainly possible. 
Verse 22, he says, repent, therefore, of this, your wickedness. And of course, uh, as believers, we need to continually be repenting of our sins. Uh, but this would indicate to me that Simon had never indicated or indicated that he had never really repented uh, from his sorceries. Uh, and certainly that would be at the heart of his sins. Uh, in verse 23, uh, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Iniquity means moral wrong or that you're captive to sin. I see that your heart is poisoned by bitterness and you're totally captive to sin. Based on what Peter says, I would say that Simon is not saved. Secondly, is what Simon says himself in verse 24. Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. He's not praying himself. He's not repenting of his sins himself. He's, uh, he's just saying, hey, how about if you pray for me? You know, that, uh, uh, you know it's, it's fine to ask other people to pray for us. Uh, but uh, again, we should be able to come to the Lord and pray to the Lord, uh, you know, on our own behalf because we have a relationship with him. Uh, and then third is what Simon does. This back up in verse 13, previous paragraph. Again, then Simon himself Notice, also believed, uh, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed. Very key word. What is he amazed at? Seeing the miracle signs uh, which were done. The word here, amazed, means confused. Uh, it means doubt. Oh, I'm amazed. I don't understand what's going on here. Uh, so here's a guy that is with Philip, uh, and he's, uh, he's had uh, an extensive influence over the city for a period of time. Uh, he has lost that influence now because of the ministry uh, of Philip and this revival that's going on. Uh, and he wants to be part of it. Uh, he believes something. He is even water baptized, apparently. But he's still very confused. Uh, and his mind is full of doubt. But he's very, very locked into and, uh, uh, and wants to know more about the signs and the miracles that are, that are taking place. So we'd say because of what Peter said, what he said, and what he does, his state of mind, he's really not uh, a believer. And we have a similar kind of a contrast of individuals early in the ministry of Jesus in uh, John chapter 2, verse 23. They are speaking of Jesus. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed, that's our same word, in his name when they saw the signs, again, signs, miracles that he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. Uh, the word believed and the word commit are the exact same word uh, in, uh, in the Greek. They believed in Jesus because they saw the miracles. He did not believe in them because he knows all men's hearts. What did they believe in? He could do miracles. <laughs> what did Simon believe? Philip could do miracles. That doesn't save anybody. That doesn't save anybody. That's the whole idea. Uh, and the point here is that salvation is more than intellectual assent. Uh, there are people sitting in churches across the, the country today that believe in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, but they're not saved. They've never really humbled themselves before the Lord. They've never repented of their sins. Their heart is still bound and captive, and the, the patterns of sin have never been broken in their lives. So listen, we all have sin. We say we have no sin. We deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Uh, uh, John says uh, in his letter in, uh, in chapter 1, verse 8, but, uh, but to be totally captivated by it, to have never repented from it. And I can tell you that as a young man, I grew up in the church, and I made lots of altar calls uh, because uh, when you're at those youth camps, uh, you know they're going to go all night that last night around that campfire and everyone's going to take their stick that represents their sin and throw it into the campfire showing that they're giving their lives to the Lord. And you learn pretty early on if you're an astute young person that uh, just throw the stick in and get it over with. You don't want to be the last guy that's the holdout because... Uh, there's no fun, there's no games, nothing until this campfire deal is, ish, is settled. You don't want to be the holdout. So we just, me and my buddies learned very early on, just make, hey, be the first guy to make the altar call. Just get it over with. Throw your stick and go out. I made lots of altar calls, I can tell you. Uh, when I was a, a senior in high school, I got baptized because that's what you did when you were a senior in high school. You had a graduation party and every senior got baptized. I got baptized. Was I saved? Absolutely not. <laughs> 
Absolutely not. Uh, is it possible for someone to say that they believe and even go through a ritual and not be saved? Absolutely. And Jesus warns about it all the time. He says that on the last day, many, not a few, but many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. And he'll say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. So Simon the sorcerer apparently remained a sorcerer. And according to church history, he continues and becomes a thorn in the flesh to the church there in Samaria. Fights against it, create problems and, uh, and so forth. Uh, never comes to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, we, need to be, we need to be careful. That when we come to faith in Christ, we're really surrendering our life to him and receiving the forgiveness that he has for us. Not just a, a intellectual assent, not just agreeing uh, with a, a couple of facts about Jesus, but really giving our lives to him. Uh, and then lastly, this new perspective caused Peter and John to become a missionary team. And uh, I love verse 25 uh, because to me it's the, uh, the proof text for the validity of short-term missions. Uh, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, re now remember how we read about them preaching in all the villages on the way up there. No, actually, they didn't do that because I don't think they really even thought the Samaritans could get saved, to tell you the truth. Uh, but when they got there and they saw Christians, and they saw Christians on this short-term mission trip they were on in another culture, uh, and they had the same relationship, and God was doing a work in them. It changed their heart, and it enlarged their heart for who really could receive the Lord and who they really should be sharing with. So on the way back, they are different men than they were going up there. So on the way back, they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in every village, uh, every Samaritan that they, uh, they, they come upon. Uh, their lives were changed, and of course, uh, they're... Uh, God's still got a lot of work to do, you know, and, uh, and Peter's kind of uh, the big fisherman's kind of a, a pretty thick-headed guy, so he's still got to get him over to, uh, to the Mediterranean, to Simon the Tanner's house, and put him on his rooftop, and give him a vision, some about three times with Peter. He's got to tell him the same thing three times uh, in a row before he finally gets it, uh, that God is going to save Gentiles in the same way uh, that he had saved the Jews. Keep in mind, when they're hearing the great commission of Jesus to go into all the world and preach the gospel, they're still running under the assumption that and all these people are going to proselytize into Judaism so that they can get saved. That, that's what's going on in their minds. So this is an earth-shattering concept, this idea that it really is by faith and by faith alone and the gospel is open to everyone. Uh, and, of course, this all culminates in chapter 15 with the church council that uh, really finally makes the determining factor about who the gospel is going to go forward to. But again, persecution started with Saul. Uh, he's at the center of it. What empowered the church was not persecution. Certainly provided some motivation and got him going. But what empowered the church uh, was the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, we could think of the words of Joseph uh, to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good on the saving of many lives. And that's what they're seeing here uh, in the early church. For us, we want to uh, remember that uh, a coming to faith in Christ is repenting of our sins and turning to Christ so that we can be saved from our sins. And when we share the gospel, we're trying to build a bridge uh, because we're trying to save one person, one person. You know, how, do we, how do we change Kailua for Jesus Christ? By saving one person. How do we change the uh, Hawaiian Islands? By saving one, one person. Uh, and there's a one person out there for all of us uh, to lead to faith in Christ. If we'll be open to it, be willing to allow the difficult circumstances of our lives to drive us, sometimes it's going to be uh, in the emergency room. Sometimes it's going to be somewhere else. We didn't plan on going. We didn't think it would be the best place. We don't think these are the people that would be the most open to the gospel. But if we recognize that God really is sovereign in control of all the events of our lives and are open to it, he'll put us in a place to build a bridge, uh, share our faith, and see others come to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. You choose the weak and make them strong. You heal the broken.